Well guys, welcome to our third and final installment here for the question and answer session. So thanks once again for sending them all in. We really appreciate it. It gave us some time to think over muskies and hopefully help you guys gain some insight into some of the Vernon Nate's uh, bait lineup and also some of our tactics. So also note, if you guys haven't headed over to our website yet, there is some new apparel over there including our Chasing 50s hoodie. We're working on getting some other stuff lined up, but uh, we're having some delays in the supply chain. But either way, we've got uh, baits, actually some of our top producing baits over there now, and then also some new apparel. So we'll leave some links in the description, and we'll also leave some links for part one and two of this series. So on to the questions right away. We'll get to it, continuation of where we left off. Now, we're gonna be talking a little bit about bow control. We mentioned, kind of touched on this, actually um, didn't touch on it, but we, had another question similar revolving around that but uh, how do you maintain good boat control positioning any tips how to improve my boat control so I think one of the things that we've always as far as boat control that we've tried to focus on is we try to work things on the slower side of things just because we're big fans of working a spot thoroughly not overkill but thoroughly working through it because um, you know, it, it, I think it, it begs to cast that area out, but as far as boat control, I mean, what we like to run for speed is kind of like that 0.6 miles per hour. I mean, if you, if you look at your GPS, you can see, you know, 0.6 miles per hour, 0.7 miles per hour is like what we find as a effective rate to yeah. work along structure. Now, obviously that's going to be depending on if what you're bucking for wind, you know, if you're running into it versus if it's pushing you, but I think a lot of times we'll try to run into the wind yeah. if if there isn't big waves. I mean, obviously you can only do that within reason, but um, you know if you got a slight breeze that obviously is going to push you along uh, weed beds or you know rock structure faster, we'll try to run up against it, and that's as long as the waves are manageable. Yeah. And um, you know you have the new your, your Altrex is a, I mean that was a game changer as far as controlling that boat better so I think a lot of you know it doesn't mean like you have to go out there and buy the highest you know best trolling motor or highest end best trolling motor but I think you know it gives you the opportunity to to put that boat in a better position mm -hmm. and the fiberglass part of it I think helps as far as you know a little bit heavier it slows not it get, down yeah it slows bit. it down not getting blown all over the place I mean it doesn't recommend going out and buying a big fiberglass boat but these are keys that I guess play into how you control the boat or how we control the boat. Um, the other thing too is depends if you're by yourself or with other people. When I fish by myself I fish way slower than I do if I have more people. Cause for me one person casting I can only cover so many areas where I need to cast two three times in a certain area and if I am running the same speed as I normally do with Ross or with Ross and Alex, I am past that area in you know one cast. So usually slower if I'm by myself, you know, a little bit quicker with other people just to keep moving and you use everybody as an advantage to get more casts in these areas. Yep, and I think boat control is crucial as far as musky fishing is concerned with how you're how, how those fish are setting up. But um, use your wind when you can. Yeah. As far as not using a trolling motor, no. if you don't have to use it, don't use it. Right, that is true. We will. Well, there are times when, if if the structure fits, we'll literally. I mean, obviously, it's, if it's not ripping us, but we'll let you know that wind take us right down the structure. Green Bay is an example where usually. We don't, I mean, on a flat calm day, we have, wherever we want to run, we can run. Mm -hmm. But literally, there's times there where you don't have a choice. You're basically using the trolling motor to guide you, or like, keep you on a line. Yeah. But the waves are what's doing, you know, all the all the work yeah. for you. I think one thing that you do when we're fishing is you're on that trolling motor quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like you're constantly, you know, Obviously, you got to kind of multitask to watch that map, you know, and to and, and to cast efficiently. But I mean, you're 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 literally like staying that course that we want. I mean, if we pick, you know, if we find that these fish are setting up off the weed edge, you know, we're we're 30 feet or you know 20 feet off that weed edge, 
and that's what we kind of stick to. And, and you can use side imaging to control your bolt better because yeah, you a can lot of times I'll be watching my side imaging and I can see how far away I am away from that weed edge and I can keep the boat positioned perfectly off that weed edge yep. from the back of the boat from what I can see with that. So I would say side imaging is a, a key and you know it's obviously you can be successful very successful musky fishing without the highest and greatest electronics but you know that is one factor as far as that we can speak from experience on is side imaging and a lot of times when we run a weed edge the first time you're putting down a trail you can learn so much as far as how that weed edge actually runs, where it turns, where the inside turn, inside and outside turns are, that your second go around is better boat control. Yeah. And this is this comes from us that you know, like when we're fishing a lot of new water, we obviously have to learn on the fly. But you know, the next time we might be off more because we say here is where we ran the first time, here's where we need to run the second, or we'll run it two different passes like that yeah. because just to find where these fish are setting up. And so use your GPS set waypoints and. If you're going around the weed edge, mark it out. Otherwise, you're trying to find it again the next time. Yep. Waypoints are your friend, that's for sure. And in today's day and age, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's really, really simple to drop waypoints. If you and, have the electronics, use them. Yeah. And that is that is a big factor as far as bolt control, I would say, because, yeah. you know, it might not be the first time you run it, but the second time you come back through, it's making sense. Yeah. And you can say, here's where I need to be, and, you know, that's where I need to go. So... Hopefully some tips lended towards boat control and positioning. Alright, next question is what is your length of PB muskies and what bait did you use to catch those muskies? So my PB, I actually have two at 50, basically right on the dot of 50. One was heavier than the other, but both were caught on a Lee Lures Boilermaker. So that is, uh, I don't know, that was, both of those were nice Green Bay fish that... Mm -hmm fought hard one was night fishing it's good to relive those memories but uh yours mine um biggest inland is 51 and a half on joe booker top raider and then out on green bay minnow bait that was a 52 so small bait big fish yep yep that's right you got yeah you got inland too multiple inland 50s my biggest inland is 49 and a half. I have yet to crack that. So, on to the next. I want to start making YouTube videos. Just curious what cameras you guys use, how you keep them charged on the water. Also wondering what your SD card situation is and how you keep the cameras going without losing space. So, as far as the cameras we're using, we kind of use a wide range, um, different era GoPros. So, we've got the main ones we're using now are Hero 7s. Uh, we do have some Hero 5s. We have some one Hero 4 that's left, the others blew up, or I blew up, but um, and then we do have a Hero 8 now, so we've got a wide range of cameras that are actually given, I mean getting you guys the footage, but I mean from what we experienced the last couple of years, the Hero 7s have worked well for us. We've heard some very bad things from other guys, which is a kind of surprise, but um, the only, I don't, I don't really have an explanation for it, I mean they've worked great for us, mm -hmm. and um, this last year we actually implemented 4K footage for the first time. So it was kind of a little bit of trial and error figuring that out. Um, overheating issues, you know, SD card sizes have dramatically increased. And uh, I guess that kind of plays into what we're running for SD cards are all bigger SD cards. So everything that we're using is 128 gigabyte and above. There are like most of the Hero 7s, Hero 8 are running 256 gigabyte. That's how I prefer to do it. That's what we found to be the best um, solution for how we fish. A lot of guys do use looping looping feature on them, which I'm always under the mindset that we get in the moment so much that it's hard to remember to stop cameras sometimes, mm -hmm. and if we don't stop them right, we lose the footage because we didn't stop before it looped. So um, that's just my take on SD cards. Some people might not agree with it, but what works the best for me is big SD cards. So um, just make sure that they fit, because uh, there's some certain GoPros that don't accept a certain size like above a 128 or whatnot so pay attention to that do a little research but um yeah I mean that's kind of our basic gist of what we're using for cameras I mean we do have a professional Sony camera too that we use for vlogging or you know whole fish holdups hunting and um, it's all it's a, it's a nice combination obviously we we try to update here and there but it's it's really worked well for us the last few years but it's taken a lot of trial and error mm -hmm. to get to where we are and um, you're, you're going to find that it takes work, work to keep these things going, 
and uh, you're going to run into the weather issues, the, I mean, moisture issues, and hot versus cold. Batteries are, are just, they drive you nuts. So um, hopefully that's a little insight into our filming setup. All right. Best advice for a young musky angler that just got into musky fishing. I would say one of the biggest things that I would recommend is time on the water. Yeah, just keep casting. And it, it sounds it sounds basic, but it's really what it takes with musky fishing. And the time on the water is going to translate into fish and learning experience. I mean, that's basically where we've where we started years and years ago was time on the water mm -hmm. and you're gonna get frustrated you're gonna have setbacks but just keep fishing and musky mm -hmm. fishing really tests your patience and it is really frustrating but at the same time it's so rewarding and I've kind of I've never hunted like these guys so like when I started hunting with them it kind of exposed me to the other side of the spectrum where the rush is like the same but like the buildup's different for like bow hunting, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, like musky fishing is so instantaneous. Like, boom, 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 we're there. I know I've I've heard Alex say it over the years. It's like now hunting, you got the buildup. You hear the deer coming usually. You know, it's like I I don't know. I mean, it's but it really takes patience either if you're hunting or if you're musky fishing. So be patient and um, cast. I mean, and try to you know, I would say watch YouTube videos, read articles. I mean, there's there's plenty of information out there that. That's how we learned is watching videos, reading. I did you know, a lot of reading over the years and you take away little bits and pieces that make you into you know, a better fisherman. And not that we're experts by any means. We have so much to learn. And um, that's kind of the fun part of the sport though. I mean, every year you're like, you're kind of putting a little bit more of the puzzle together. Yeah. And it just takes hard work. So pushing on to the next. When you don't have a bite, what do you prefer to change first? Place or lure? I'm going to say, I think we both probably agree, place. place yeah. I mean, we, our biggest thing is we kind of, we don't have a ton of lures that we go through on a trip. There's some that I, I guess warrant it, but most of the time we kind of have our core, you know, core group of lures that it's like, we know it's going to produce fish. Yeah, and you throw one type, I throw a different type. Falks with us, we get three types of different baits to throw at one time. Yep. So you can cover that area up usually with, you know, however many people you're fishing with. So if you're not seeing any fish, well, I mean, you can't really change those baits up that much, so mm -hmm. you go to a different area. And I think at, at times you can get too caught up in changing lures, mm -hmm. whereas it's, you know, not nothing against that because it's frustrating. Some days you're just like, what do I have to yeah. use? But, I, I mean, we know in our minds what has been working, what should be working, and I, th I think a lot of times it's location is mm -hmm. the biggest thing. And it's timing because, you know, muskies, it's just like humans. We aren't feeding all day. We have our certain times that we're hungry. We have our certain times that we're feeding. Now, can you get reaction strikes? Of course. Mm -hmm. It's like us walking by the candy bowl. We grab something to eat it. You know, whereas, like, a muskie's not actively feeding all the time. But I think location is key. And, you know, if, if, we're, not, if we're not seeing fish or finding fish, we're going to move on to the next. Yeah. And that is one great thing about northern Wisconsin, too, is if one lake seems to be off, we bounce to a different one. Yeah. Or we go to the next one a different day. And I really, I, I think it really comes down to lo location on lakes and different lakes for us. Yeah. So, what do you guys think about the size of lure during the season? I would say we kind of have a natural progression of smaller to bigger yeah. with a certain with a, I mean it, to a certain extent um, you know we're gonna start out with small block tails early in the season smaller crankbaits those kind of transition to us I mean like we like smaller crankbaits minnow baits the whole year almost but yeah. um, you know we even at times we've run smaller suex early in season yeah not very often but we you know we have implemented it but I would say it's a natural progression smaller to bigger with I mean, you know, smaller single-bladed bucktails in the spring, then we kind of transition or mix real closely the double-bladed stuff, move up to nines, tens later in the season, yeah. um, and then we're kind of, it's the same same progression, I guess, for, you know, top water is pretty consistent as far as size yeah. is concerned, but I would say bucktails kind of is our biggest progression as far yeah. as smaller to bigger, but that's kind of our general thought process on that. 
Alright, the next question is which temperature of water must it be before you guys go fishing in the spring? So, to answer that, I would say for us in Wisconsin, once once the season opens, we're fishing. Yeah. It doesn't really necessarily matter so much on temperature. Obviously, how we target the fish is gonna that's gonna be a little bit different based on temperature. And how the fish react. Right. But we still wanna be out there, we still wanna be casting. Yep as much as we possibly can. And I wouldn't say, you know, like, if it, if it say, like, the spring, the, the season opens at 55 degrees, um, you know, we're going to be targeting the fish differently than they would be 65, yeah. but we're still going to be fishing. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it's it, it's different. It, we don't have the experience of, like, guys down south where, like, seasons are open, like, year-round or, like, a, a greater majority of the year than we are. I mean, we basically run, I mean, it's where we're all day weekend, say, but, like, May till November up here in Wisconsin and that's kind of what we relate to but hopefully that kind of answers that question I mean it's more based on just time to get out fishing and we prefer obviously to wait till after we know there's no spawn going on I mean we would that's where we err just because you know let them do their thing and then get to fishing so but then you know as far as water temperature is concerned I would say one thing that we don't necessarily do is fish when it's hot yeah I mean, we kind of back off just, you know, peak summer when it really seems like, you know, if you're, if you're pushing water temps over 80, I mean, we really try to back off. And, Last year was bad. Yep. And that was, that kind of cut into a lot of our fishing. Yeah. Multiple weekends where we just, we said, whatever, you know, we're going to, it's, it's tough on us because we had such a string of hot weather, yeah. or such a string of hot weather, plus um, we just like to give the muskies a break then. So just some considerations as far as temperature and fishing. All right, night fishing. What's the best condition for it as far as temperature of the water, part of the season, and weather? I would say, you know, I mean, where we start night fishing more is probably when it's warmer. If we got hot weather going, where water temps are increasing, and, you know, we got a 90 degree weekend coming up, we're like, let's fish at night. I mean, that's the one thing, like, when we're sleeping, fish are eating. Yeah. And we found that out that, I mean, it's. I would say I don't really think there is a set water temp where we would begin fish, night fishing at. My personal preference would be to say fish above 65 degrees night fishing, but that's no set. That's nothing set in stone. That's just kind of how it feels to me. And I mean, from our experience, like I said, they're always eating. And you know, obviously, it's not 24 hours a day, but you you're going to have a night window. It seems like. Yeah. And um, you know, have we done better full versus new moon? You know, that's another thing. We haven't really. We don't have a clear. Uh, indicator one way or the other I would say no you can't pin it down no the key would be you know more so I think night fishing is the right baits you know like a boiler maker um, you know like a water chopper top water like that uh, big blades it's kind of what we like to I mean I think it's more important to key in on the baits that you're using and slow things down mm -hmm. because they're feeding basically I mean Obviously, they're feeding off a site to a certain extent, but vibration is, you know, what those things are going after. So keep that in mind. I would slow things down. Same thing with dirty water. A lot of times, like if you got super dirty water, it might it pay to slow things down. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers some of that. So the next question here is, how do you target spring muskies, and where can they be found? So as with, I would say as with any, you know, as far as muskies are concerned, any time of the year. Where's the bait? Yeah. The bait. And, I mean, bait are pushing shallow early in the year. They're going into spawn. So muskies are going to be, I mean, we would specifically be targeting like shallow weeds, shallow flats, um, like where water's warming up, the, you know, first, earliest. And early season muskie for us usually begins end of May after they're done with that, with the spawning and whatnot usually. And, I mean, we're going to be going to our shallow structure as long as we haven't had a crazy warm spring yeah. that, you know, jumped water temperatures to say 75 degrees right off the bat. You know, if it's a normal progression, we're gonna be sticking, like I said, shallow weeds, shallow cover, uh, shallow flats, and you know, say six feet or less. Yeah, wherever that first growth happens, that's usually where they're gonna be. That is another good point too, as far as um, when you got new weed growth, yeah. where you can find like good green weeds right off the bat, you know you're gonna have bait fish that are, you know, moving in towards that. and. Um, muskies follow so that would be some thoughts as far as um, how to target spring muskies and where they can be found but you know 
we kind of touched on some of the smaller baits, like we said too, uh, smaller bucktails, spring muskies, and uh, what smaller crankbaits is kind of our go-to right off the bat. All right, so this one is what does turnover mean in terms of seasons and muskie fishing? Turnover is a <laughs> interesting time. I mean, obviously it's fall, but uh, I would say gray area. It's yeah. a gray area. We kind of try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, we fish rivers a lot yep. more so during that time. Shallow lakes. Yeah, like to piggyback off that one thing to keep in mind is not all lakes turn over or like actually have a, a legitimate turnover, a true turnover, I should say. I mean, you're going to have like deeper lakes where there's a thermal line, you're going to have a turnover. But not all of them do it at the same time. You know, I mean, they're, they're roughly kind of, you know, around that same period of time but um i would say you know what we kind of have in our mind as a benchmark is like the 55 degree water temp is it set in stone no but um that's kind of like where we know it's basically basically approaching or it's going to be happening soon so i mean things to look for is like you know extremely stained water that you don't normally see i mean that can be a direct turnoff for us i mean if we show up to a lake and we're like oh, this isn't you know this is like pea soup or something yeah, like that looks odd um and then like i said that benchmark of water temp uh, you know, it's, it's different in all time, you know, all different states, different locations when it's going to happen. But um, we really try to key in on, say, shallower lakes and rivers during that time period just because it, it can really be a frustrating time to figure out where these fish are setting up, where they went, or what they're doing. Yeah. And it'll drive you nuts, just like, I mean, muskies tend to anyways. But, I mean, I think, you know, as far as musky fishing, there's still fish to be caught. It's just a matter of finding the right body of water and, um, you know, one that's not really in the progression of turnover because after turnover things can light right up again yeah so that's a little bit of info as far as turnover is concerned so hopefully that helps have you ever set a sucker rig out during the early part of the season and if so would you suggest it i would say no one yes yeah we haven't but definitely something that i mean it works yeah i mean suckers are a main diet of muskies and it's, you know, we, I think you primarily only see it happening in the fall just because it's the most common thing to do. But yeah, I would, I mean, it, obviously maybe we could try it this year. I mean, just for something to do different, but it, I would definitely give it a try. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of, sometimes you just get kind of in your rut where you're, you know, it's early season, you're just casting. Yeah, you, you think want to cast. Yeah, but that's a good way to think out of the box, I, honestly. I mean, I would not put it bad. I would, I would definitely give it a try. You know, it's. It would be interesting to see what we could do as far as um, setting sucker rigs out early, and you guys too. So, if you if you guys end up trying that, send us some pictures on social media and some messages or Instagram on Instagram or Facebook. We we'd love to hear it. All right. So now we're moving on to looking for a new reel. What should I get? Whew, a little bit. Of, it's a tough question. I mean, because a lot of what a reel. You know a new reel goes into is what you're going to primarily use it for yeah. and you know how it fits in your hand the feel but i would say as far as some general information if you guys are looking for a new reel um you do have experience with the shimano 400 yeah it's the tranks solid reel it's higher end so it costs you know, i would say a little bit more than some of the other ones yeah its price point is is definitely higher yeah. but it's it's a quality reel yeah. i mean you've definitely had some some success with it and it, it fits nicely in your hand that's yeah. the one thing I've it is about. it's very small so if you're looking for a smaller you know profile reel it's good for that yeah and, it, and then to like touch on I mean what I've grown up using is Abu Garcia's you know the the new beast is out now what we have is all the discontinued you know it's the older style beast we can speak from that experience Abu, I mean, Abu Garcia's have held up great for us yeah. over the years. But the key for musky reels from Abu Garcia is staying in the Revo Toro line. A little bit of insight into picking some new reels. All right, two questions here. What type of lure would you recommend throwing first while fishing a new body of water? Do you start fishing near deep, shallow, or where depth changes from shallow to deep? When you, and that, this is all basically revolving around when you fish new legs. So I, I would say, I mean, type of lure while we're fishing a new body of water, probably gonna go, somebody's gonna be running a search bait, yeah. bucktail, as far as, I mean, not, not, not that it's just a search bait, but it works effectively as a search bait. 
and you can pull fish out of cover, you can find out where they're setting up, and I would say, you know, for us, probably somebody throwing a double eights, and probably somebody throwing some type of twitch bait, Yeah, I would say. Um, you're not going to cover your water as fast with a twitch bait, but it's not all about speed either, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, being thorough, as well as still keep moving, but um, I would say that would be our go-to is for coming to a new body of water first, maybe top water, you know, if it's a good... Yeah, depending on how the conditions are and how the lake is set up, top water is another good one for getting follows, as well as, I mean, catching fish. Right, right, and, and one of the episodes we had this year, this is what you threw on, brand new lake, and you got a 39 inch out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, it, but it's, it's a search bait. I was using a Suic at the time. So like, there's a little confirmation on how we roll as far as, you know, getting to a, a lake for the first time, what we're pulling out as far as baits. Do you start fishing near deep, shallow, or where the depth changes? So I would say the, the important thing to key in here is not necessarily depth, but structure. Yeah. So where are you finding your weeds? You got to think of what fish are, we're going to relate to. Weeds, rocks, um, you know, underwater points, humps, stuff like that. That would be kind of our first go-to. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of, you know, then you kind of get to get a feel as far as like what the depth of the lake is about, you know, how high are these humps coming up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, there's no set depth, I would say, in mine is more structure related because fish are holding to cover where bait is holding. Yeah. So, all right, we had a final question here is side imaging. Video on what you're seeing, how that's changing, what you're doing, tips and tutorials. So this is an idea that we have here that we could do for the future. We could kind of touch on a video as far as like what we're using, how we're using side imaging or setup like that. So that's a good idea. So thanks for that. We'll take that into consideration as we move into the summer here. But um, any tips as far as side imaging? I mean, it's a game changer for us. Yeah, you definitely see a lot that you wouldn't see with sonar or even down imaging, yep. you're gonna see what's on each side of you. Cause you might not know that hump is out, you know, a hundred feet that way, but with side imaging, it glows. Right. And you can actually see and I think you that's get a, on it. I think you get a, be a lot better picture of what, like the rock structure looks like, say, you know, is it true boulders? And you don't, you don't have to run right over it mm -hmm. to find it. And um, I don't know, as much as we can use it, we use it. I mean, mm -hmm. it really helps lessen the learning curve when you get into new water or even like when you're fishing across flats, sometimes you see fish yeah. and it's like, holy cow. I mean, we know fish are here. They're just not eating yet. So, yeah. you know, that at least it tells you you're fishing the right spot because it's, it's fairly easy to tell, especially on mega imaging with yeah. side imaging where these fish are setting up as long as you got everything set right. So, um, I don't know. I love it. I like side imaging. So, yeah. we'll uh, yeah, we'll try to work on a video like that in the future, and uh, that wraps all of our questions. So I think we hit all of them. If we missed one, we apologize. But um, we gotta thank you guys for sending in the questions. It was yeah. definitely fun to do and something different. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the whole series here, and uh, we got some more musky information out there. So that's our setup. That's our thinking, and. Uh, that's what Bernard Nates is about. So we got to thank you guys for watching. We'll see you on the next episode.